films even after losing a box After a five mile walk around town I never smell your socks You hid movies from your folks And your mom hid them from your grandma And a lot of the time that we hang out You record it with your camera Always have the strength to forgive When I hit you in the eye You eat Chinese ramen nachos Fish even pizza pie Standing tall with curly hair Leather jacket wrapped Oh look here he comes The Million Film Almanac Bobbly 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 Bellissimo Hi, and welcome to Terribly Fun Film. Today, we're looking at what is arguably the best, and it's definitely the most well-known of the Conan the Barbarian ripoff after that Arnold Schwarzenegger starring movie got released and became massive, massive hit. I'm, of course, referring to The Beastmaster. The Beastmaster is a 1982 Don Coscarelli film that spawned two sequels. I believe the second one got a theatrical release. I might be wrong there, though. And the third one was definitely made for TV. And a TV show that, from my understanding, doesn't tie in to the other movies, except for maybe this first one. But we all get the first one today. As you just heard me mention, it is from Don Cascarielli, who is m most known probably for the Phantasm films, of which the 13 things he's directed over his career takes up like half of them. So, is it good? Do it deserve these sequels? Do they age well? Is it super, super cheesy? Let's find out if I review The Beastmaster. The Beastmaster follows Daw, played by Mark Singer, who, as a fetus in his mom's belly, is stolen out of there by these haggard, demonic-looking witches and zapped off into a special place to where the evil Max, played by Rip Torn, cannot find or kill him based on a prophecy that this will be the guy to take down Max in his evil reign. Interesting way to start a movie, to say the least. We then flash forward to 20-some-odd years later, where Jar is all grown up, played by Mark Singer, and Ken talk to animals, thus the Beastmaster movie title. And he happens to run across Kiri, played by Tanya Roberts, as she's trying to escape kidnappers because she doesn't want to be sacrificed to an ancient demonic power that will give Max ultimate control over everything, basically. So, Dar, Kiri, and a few others team up along with Dar's animals in order to take down the evil sorcerer. That does sound like the plot of every hard pulp fantasy story you've ever heard. I realize this. But, it works really well here in part because the simplicity of it allows for a very quick moving of movies. They don't get bogged down in that much mythology. They don't stop the movie for five minutes just to explain everything to the audience. And they trust the audience enough to be able to recall beyond the last 30 seconds or so. So things aren't really repeated. There's generally speaking only one or two exposition dumps. It's the very beginning of the movie with Max and the three haggard witches. And when Kiri is explaining what's happening to Dar after he initially rescues her, actually rescues her, they actually meet because he fakes a, uh, an animal attack using his pet panther, I believe it is. 
Now, the movie simplicity allows it to just keep going and focus on the things that need to be focused on more so than plot. Strong characterization, interesting world, magic, and crazy, insane imagery. This clearly comes from the guy that created the Phantasm series. This clearly comes from the guy who directed Bubba Hotep and Survival Quest. It's just weird looking, like, um, there's a, like a mini box, for lack of a better term, at the end of the movie, who's got this bizarre bondage, gimp life mask on, and these heavy clawed fingers. But like, like they're gauntlets, but like the, the fingers come out like they're animal claws, and smashing through pipes, trying to chase the thing, and just, it looks so weird, and so unique, that this movie being popular enough to, uh, to, to get sequels and spin-offs and all that stuff makes total sense to me. It, it really is just impressive in that regard. The action scenes are fairly exciting if they're a bit stagey. The camera never gets that close, it's kind of held back and we just let the actors or the animals do their thing for the most part. But the choreography is good. It, looks like all the actors are doing their own stunts, things like that, so so it works on that level, so it not being a bit more stylish isn't a huge deal. John Alcott's cinematography helps immensely here, as this film is gorgeous, not just the weird grotesque imagery that clearly came from Cascarielli's brain, but just the, the overall look of the film is very lush, very pretty. And that helped sell the fantasy world extremely, extremely well. Because the world is so enchanting, because they film it in a way that makes it look so good, you buy into this landscape being haunted. You, you buy in to a creepy cave in the middle of nowhere just summoning ghosts. Because they film the locations in such uh engaging in the visual manner. It allows for the visuals to emphasize the wonder of the fantastical world the movie takes place in. They don't need to boil down and describe everything to us. They're letting the visuals, the costumes, the cinematography, just the way the world looks fill in those gaps for us. I Meaning the film is very visually heavy outside of the grotesque stuff I was just talking about and that makes it better than some of the other ripoffs like Hawk the Slayer which is silly and goofy but looks very paint by the numbers in terms of fantasy movies. This does not. Hey, there aren't that many sports. It's a lot of uh, desert and oasis type stuff. B. Again, that grotesque imagery, the witches, the mini boss I was just describing, the way this ring one of the characters wears opens and closes and it has an eyeball, it has an eyeball on it, it's super freaky. Uh, the best comparison I have is something like Kroll. If you've seen Kroll and not this, that should give you at least some idea of the sort of uh, somewhat over the top imagery that happens throughout. And that is one of the things that sets this movie apart so well from everything else. In terms of the characterization, Dar has a really great uh, arc. Max, obviously villainous, obviously villainous from the beginning because the king tries to kill him for being villainous. Uh, so that, that all works. But Kiri doesn't have a lot to do aside from get kidnapped and be rescued. Uh, Tanya Roberts does an awesome job as her. And the few fight scenes that the entry gets uh, help overcome some of the earlier issues with uh, writing in that character. And then some of the side characters, interesting though they are, are just kind of there to help fulfill Dar and Kiri's quest and not characters unto themselves. But that's a minor issue overall. You'll show me which Tanya Roberts being really good, and she is. She's fun. She's intense, she's excellent in the action scenes later on, and chemistry with Mark Singer is very good, so they're sort of 
instant uh, head over heels with each other. It makes total sense. Mark Singer, for his part, interacts with his animal co-stars very naturally, very well. They uh, seem to be an extension of him as they're meant to be for the character. And I'm not sure another actor could have done that. Some of the line readings aren't 100% believable from them, mostly in the few exposition moments that character has. Um, but when he's quipping, when he's fighting, or when he's talking to the animals, he does an excellent job. Rip Torn as the main bad guy is freaking hilarious. Um, he tries to play it straight, but he just basically, it looks like he painted on angry elf eyebrows and just scowled the entire time and that's kind of the extent of what he does and it makes it very amusing and despite the number of times I've seen this movie I'm not sure if that's meant to be comedic or not I, I'm not positive there there is a uh, a warrior monk type character named Seth played by John Amos who is taking Cal a young boy uh, on the way to uh, training to be a warrior monk and played by Joshua Millard and they're both really good they play off of each other very well they add much needed levity without it feeling forced their comedic bits actually work really organically within the story and how they interact with everybody else the big thing here is the special effects, not just the grotesque images, but the special effects themselves hold up really, really well, especially the ending uh, stuff. Better so for the climax of the movie than the Conan the Barbarian, which is an overall better movie, mind you. And that is because not only is it all practical, but it is all somewhat exaggerated. It is all grotesque. So, they didn't need it to look realistic once. They didn't need it to to feel like our world at all. This allowed them some freedom when designing these things to be not just as weird as possible, but even if it's moving kind of oddly. The costumes by Betty Peach and Madden are basic but fine for our lead Hero. Dar wears a loincloth. Kiri wears kind of a loincloth, loincloth dress. I don't know what else to call it. The Seth the Pilgrim and his young ward pal are dressed somewhat similarly. And this all comes straight out of any fantasy cover you've seen. You can kind of get what these people are dressed like. But the bad guys look ridiculous as you've heard me mention all the good test imagery and whatnot and that's really fun to look at really cool i can only imagine how long it took to play to make these crosses they're awesome lee holdridge's score is very exciting and a lot of fun the beastmaster theme dar's theme is great it is energetic and fun and sounds like an adventure. Like you listen to it and you're like, I'm going on an adventure while listening to the song. It's it's awesome. The entire score is like that, but that is my favorite uh bit of music from the movie. Climatic score during during the big showdown between Max and Dar is also really great. It's a little darker than the rest of the movie, which is nice. And it builds very well until, you know, the final bad guy death and all that jazz. It's, really exciting. So, is the Beastmaster cheesy? Yes, it has some silly lines and ridiculous moments. Now one or two moments that did not age well due to the movie's view of feminism, due to technology and things like that, but 99% of the film doesn't just hold up, but holds up really, really well. It's energetic and it's fun and it's frenetic and it's crazy and I loved every second of it and I've seen this movie several times that tells you anything. Something like Talos is the 
more horror based imagery that Don Coscarelli uh, is clearly in love with is that it does not look like a traditional fantasy film and that is a breath of fresh air for these sorts of films and I definitely recommend checking this out if you haven't seen it as always I've been your host Bobby thank you for watching and I'll see you next time with you can probably figure it out Beastmaster to Portal Through Time.